Okay. I'm going to give a few minutes for everybody to catch up. Evidently, we've all had this software update since last week. And none of my computers, except for my wife's phone, is allowing us to broadcast. So... Uh, none of our computers are working. <laughs> it seems like there's a um, a software update. And so, anyway, I'm going to give a couple of minutes for everyone to catch up. And I apologize for last minute. I tried like f three different computers. Um, and hopefully this won't be... Um, a complete catastrophe. Anyway, it's good to see everybody uh, tonight, and I trust that you're all well. It's a it's good to know the Lord and serve Him. And tonight we're planning on studying the Bible further in. Uh, the book of Lamentations. I'm going to be... Uh, well, that's sideways, sorry. I can't turn my phone, sorry. Um, I'm going to be presenting... Um, from... Lamentations chapter 1, the second half. And we're, I'm going to begin just by reading the scripture. Lamentations chapter 1, and beginning in... Verse 12. Okay. Bible says, Is it nothing to you, all you that pass by, Behold, and see, if there be any sorrow like unto my sorrow, which is done unto me, wherewith the Lord hath afflicted me in the day of his fierce anger. From above hath he sent fire into my bones, and it prevaileth against me. He hath spread a net for my feet, he hath turned me back. He hath made me desolate and faint all the day. The yoke of transgression is bound by his hand. They are wreathed and come up upon the neck. He'th made me my strength to fall, and the Lord hath delivered me into their hands, from whom I am not able to rise up. The Lord hath trodden underfoot all my mighty men in the midst of me. He hath called an assembly against me to crush my young men. The Lord hath trodden the virgin, the daughter of Judah, as in a winepress. For these things I weep. Mine eye... Mine eye runneth down with water, because the comforter that should relieve my soul is far from me. My children are desolate, because the enemy prevails. Zion spreadeth forth her hands, and there is none to comfort her. The Lord hath commanded concerning Jacob that his adversaries should be round about him. Jerusalem is as a menstruous woman among them. The Lord is righteous. For I have rebelled against his commandment. Hear, I pray you, all people, and behold my sorrow. My virgins and my young men are gone into captivity. I called for my lovers, but they deceived me. My priests and my elders gave up the ghost in the city, while they sought their meat to relieve their souls. Behold, O Lord, for I am in distress. My bowels are troubled, 
My heart is turned within me, for I have grievously rebelled. Abroad the sword bereaveth, at home there is as death. They've heard that I sigh, there is none to comfort me. All mine enemies have heard of my trouble. They are glad that thou hast done it. Thou wilt bring the day that thou hast called, and they shall be like unto me. Let all their wickedness come before thee, and do unto them as thou hast done unto me for all my transgressions. For my sighs are many, and my heart is faint. Let's begin with prayer. Father, this evening as we look into your word and consider these words of lamentation, would you help us to see your purpose, to understand your promise, and to look forward, Father, to what you're doing, what you're going to do. Give us wisdom. Give me wisdom. Thank you for the opportunity to meet with my brethren, even in this virtual setting. Bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So, again, I wanted to say, uh, apologize for coming to the party late and having um, some technical issues that I didn't prepare for, but Lord willing, we're going to keep moving forward and be able to uh, have this Bible study anyway. I appreciate all of you that are here. That's a blessing. And uh, we're going to, we're just going to keep moving forward. All right, so as we are looking at this scripture, this is the second half to Lamentation chapter 1. I know it's a little bit unfortunate to take a poem and kind of divide it in half um, and kind of lose some of the momentum that we had last week, but it is a somewhat natural break, and so hopefully... If we can keep in mind um, what we learned from last week, uh, that will be beneficial. Last week we looked at the, the speaker, the preacher, the prophet. We looked at Jeremiah himself and his, his um, attitude, his demeanor. Um, his ministry as a weeper, in, in a sense. His, his ministry of lamentation and how um, that was a very proper and appropriate um, condition for him under the circumstances of that historical period. And now, in the second half of this, of this poem... From verses 12 to 22, we hear a change of voice. We talked about how the poem could be perceived as um, theater, where you have different characters playing different parts. And so at this juncture now, the, um, the character, the, 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 the person who is speaking now is... Uh, the city of Jerusalem herself, all right? We know the city of Jerusalem is personified as a lady, and here um, she takes into her mouth uh, her own mourning. And after the preacher has kind of primed her in understanding of her mourning and and um, has seen to the, the situation that she's in, now she's going to respond in like manner, and she's going to take up um, a, re um, a lamentation for herself. Now, as we think of her speaking her own lamentation, um, there's a lot of things that come to mind 
and um uh, If, if I know it's difficult, and I'm not saying necessarily, and I hope um, we're not thinking this, that our personal condition necessarily is to the same extent or in the same um, range of experience with the, the um, city of Jerusalem and the things that they experienced. But there are some commonalities, and part of the commonality is the pervasiveness, the ubiquity of human suffering, right? It's almost um, axiomatic with being human is that we suffer. And so in that sense, we can certainly relate to this, or we should, right? And so this first verse that we come to, verse 12, really brings this home the um the she a is asking this question is it nothing to you all ye that pass by she's eliciting mercy she's eliciting pity she is eliciting attention right um you know if you see someone who is in pain someone who is um struggling someone who is in trouble someone who is in a very poor condition what is our what is our reaction is it to get real nervous and walk away is it to reach out and help to try to do something what what is our initial reaction um and so you know, this is from the perspective of the person who is vulnerable, the person who is hurting, and she is calling out, Is it nothing to you, all ye that pass by? And as she calls out, she um, begins to look at and to kind of um, elaborate on her complaint, her, her um, pain. Her morning. Um, so, again, I question: What do we do when we're visiting someone who is mourning? Do we pull out our trite phrases? I confess, I'm I'm good at this, right? Um, I I have a, you know a store of Christian phrases that I can use to help people, or at least to help me feel better about the people who are suffering. But let's look for an, a minute at the ancient Eastern cultures and how they um, they had some ritual ways in which to identify with the mourner. And um, perhaps you would remember when we were um, going through the book of Job that we kind of touched on some of these things. What did Job's friends do? whenever they saw that he was in pain. You know, at first, they came and just sat there and just um, sat with him and sat in silence and joined him on the ash heap, right? And so here as we are um, thinking about this, there are some... I, I, I'm calling them rituals, some some uh, cultural norms, uh, some things that we go through in order to identify with the person who's suffering. And one is to change our clothes. Oh, so I, I forgot to put this one. A lot of people on the first view of this of this uh, condition. What do they do? They grab their own clothes and they rip them, right? Now, you have to think about this. This isn't just um, pulling the buttons off of an old shirt. Um, usually, most people had two sets of clothes to their name. You know, they had one set that they're wearing and the other set that's in the wash. And 
Um, the clothing was um, well built. It was made to be durable. Um, you know, if you bought a set of clothes in a year, you know, that was a big thing. So to rip a set of clothes was an extreme gesture of surprise and astonishment. It kind of goes with the very first verse that we read um, over in uh, there in, in verse 1. It says, how? Right? Whenever the preachers first started expressing the lamentation for the city of Jerusalem, his first word was, how doth the city sit solitary? It's this outcrying of surprise and anxiety and uh, and um you know disbelief in a sense and so um that ripping of the garment is that same thing and so after you've ripped your good garment then you then you get an old um old burlap material so basically, this isn't a garment. This is a non-garment, right? It's some pieces of old flour sack that you wrap around yourself to pre preserve your modesty, but to indicate that you're not in any condition to dress up at the, at the moment, right? So you're putting on sackcloth, and uh, the psalmist uses this as a picture of mourning at times, Psalm 69 11 says, I made sackcloth also my garment. I became a proverb to them. Or um, David says whenever he saw his enemies in grievous condition that he went and he made himself to be a friend of them. As for me, when they were sick, my sackcloth was, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled my soul with fasting and my prayer returned into my own bosom. So, you rip your clothes, you put on sackcloth, you sit with them in um, the ashes. Jeremiah uses this a lot. O oh, daughter of my people, gird thee with sackcloth, wallow thyself in ashes. Um, Job sitting there upon the ash heap was a symbol of his mourning, a symbol of his condition, a symbol of his feeling distraught. Um unworthy, you know, to sit on, in, on, in, you know, sit on a, a decent couch or a decent seat or even come inside. Make thee mourning as for an only son, most bitter lamentation, for the spoiler shall suddenly come upon thee. Jeremiah 6, 26. And then, howl ye shepherds and cry, wallow yourselves in the ashes, ye principal of the flock, for the days of your slaughter and of your dispersions are accomplished, and you'll fall like a pleasant vessel." So, the, so adapting yourself to a condition of ashes that some people would say they would sprinkle the ashes symbolically upon their head or they would sprinkle dust. And this has, um, ritually, it has the idea of, you know, I came from dust and I'm going to dust, right? As humans, we are but dust. We are, um, our, our light, we're mortal, we're sub subject to mortality. We're subject to the um, ravages of time and of death. And therefore, um, we are, um, are, you know, are symbolically sprinkling the ashes and the dust. Then in Jeremiah 9, 7, he says he called for the mourning women. There were certain people who actually had a job or a role in being kind of the mourn the the mourning vocalizers um maybe they had good voices or maybe they knew the incantations the the maybe they knew the dirges the words of the sad songs um but i i, I mean i've actually been to um a funeral like this before in other cultures where they have you know there's this certain lady in the 
in, you know, and they arrange for her to come after the body's been laid out in the in the front room of the house, and she comes and she, you know, she'll spend some time uh, vocalizing and and crying out and and leading others, and some people will, you know, may join her in some of the more familiar um, choruses and, and things like that, but. She is paid good money, and that's that's part of her job, right? She is a mourner. She's a professional mourner. And so here, Jeremiah, or, or the Lord tells Jeremiah, by contrast, to find one of these. And he's using the term of mourning in the sense of prayer, right? Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider ye and call for the mourning women, that they may come, and send for the cunning women, that they may come and let them make haste and take up a wailing for us. And whenever you hear the wailing, their articulate um, version of crying, that our eyes may run down with tears and our eyelids gush out with waters. For a voice of wailing is heard out of Zion. How are we spoiled? We are greatly confounded because we've forsaken the land, because our dwellings have cast us out. Yet hear the word of the Lord, O ye women, and let your ear receive the word of, the, of his mouth, and teach your daughters wailing. So not only do you elicit those who know how to mourn, who know that proper um, respectful attitude and frame of mind that that should have been characteristic of Judah and Israel whenever they realized that they were in this condition of rebellion against the Lord, but also teach. Take your daughters in, in hand. You know, and it's using women and daughters, um, but you can, you know, you can extrapolate that to all of our people, right? We need to learn to mourn. Teach your daughters to wail. And every one teach her neighbor lamentation. And then there's a partic there was actually in Israel a particular class of people who had this job. Right? The the fourth um the fourth characteristic that I want to bring out um that was an identifiable mark of mourning was covering the head. Taking a shawl or taking a drape of some kind and, and pulling it up over the head. Or, or, or baldness. So both of these were considered unbecoming of manhood. Uh, either a head covering or baldness. And so um, when a person felt unmanly or um, inadequate for the situation, he would cover his head. Jeremiah 14, 1, the word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah concerning the dearth. Judah mourneth. The gates thereof languish. They are black to the ground, and the cry of Jerusalem has gone up. Their nabal, nobles have sent their little ones to the waters. They came to the pits and found no water. They returned with their vessels empty. They were ashamed and confounded, and they covered their heads. Because the ground is chapped. For there was no rain in the earth. The plowmen were ashamed. They covered their heads. And the Lord dedicated a group of men, the priests, who would perpetually keep their heads covered in a sign of constant prayer, in a sign of constantly bearing the sins of the nation before the Lord. But of course, we know that the, the priests had dropped the ball. They had um neglected their duty. While they may have worn the outward head covering, they had forgotten its purpose and they had forgotten their role. And Jeremiah was one of those who went about with his head covered. We know as a matter of historic of cultural history that Israel ever since after the Babylonian captivity, um Orthodox Jews won't go anywhere without their head covered. They'll they'll wear their their hat or they'll well, wear their little yarmulke whenever they go in to worship. Um, and that's a sign of, of acknowledgement that, you know, we are not in the condition that we should have been in ever since that, that period of time, uh, 
you know, the nation isn't where it should be and it hasn't been restored and they're still in mourning waiting for the true redemption. So, um, I've been reading using uh, somewhat the um, the commentary by Kyle and Lich, and this is a couple of observations that Kyle made um, on the Book of Lamentation. He says the importance of lamentation as a part of the canon does not so much consist in the mere fact that they were composed by Jeremiah and contain outpourings of sorrow on different occasions over the mystery of his people, as rather in there being an evidence of the interest with which Jeremiah, in the discharge of his functions as a prophet, continued to watch over the ruins of Jerusalem. In these lamentations, he seeks not merely to give expression to the sorrow of the people, that he may weep with them, but by his outpouring of complaint, to rouse his fellow countrymen to an acknowledgement of God's justice in this visitation, to keep them from despair, Ah, notice that going through the process of mourning is not giving in to despair, but it's actually working through the pain and the sorrow in order to deal with it and not give in to despair. And I think um, as we continue um, in these verses here, we will see that that attitude shine forth as, as they work through the process of mourning. Keep them from despair under the burden of unutterable woe, and by teaching them how to give due submission to the judgment that has befallen them, to lead once more to God those who would not let themselves be brought to him through his previous testimony regarding the judgment while it was yet impending. The Jewish synagogue is recognized and duly estimates the importance of lamentations in these respects by appointing that the book should be read on the anniversary of the destruction of the temple. Every year on that anniversary, the book of Lamentations is read in public by those who are um, observers of the Jewish holidays. A like appreciation has been made by the Christian church, and he's specifically talking about some of the churches in, in Germany where, where Kyle um, was a minister, which rightly perceiving that the Israelitish community is the subject in these poems, attributed to them a reference to the church militant. And viewing the judgment on the people of God as a prophecy of the judgment that came on him who took the sins of the whole world upon himself, that has received a portion of the lamentations into the ritual for the Passion Week. So in the Christian church, we even recite portions of the lamentations on Passion Week, or it's part of the liturgy in, in some churches. And concludes each of these lessons with the words, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, turn back to the Lord your God. Convertere a de dominum deum tuum. The motives for this choice are so far set forth by Alioli, um, and then listen to this quote, this is really interesting. The church wished believers to see and the great punishments which God had ordained against Jerusalem by the instrumentality of Nebuchadnezzar, the still more severe chastisement that God has brought on Israel after the dreadful murder of the Messiah. She seeks to bewail the unhappy condition of the blinded nation, once favored with the divine revelation. In the fall of Jerusalem, she seeks to deplore the evil that has come on herself from external and internal foes, the persecution of brother by brother the havoc made by false teachers, the looseness of opinions, the sad advancements made by indifference in matters of faith and by the corruption of morals. In the dev devastation and the penalties inflicted on Jerusalem, she wishes to present for consideration the destruction which comes on every soul that dies the death in sin. In the condition of the ruined city and the homeless nation, she seeks to make men bewail the homeless condition of the whole race, who have fallen into decay and disorder through Adam's sin. And lastly, in the nation visited with punishment, she seeks to set forth Jesus Christ himself, insofar as he has become the substitute of all men and suffered for their sins. 
This b display of all these references is sadly deficient in logical arrangement, but it contains a precious kernel of biblical truth which the evangelical church has endeavored in many ways to turn to advantage. And so, as we come to verse 13, we see here... The, um, the enumeration of the pain. So verse 13 through 15, the, um, she begins to use some figurative language, some poetic language to enumerate and illustrate her pains. We see there in verse 13, um, it says, From above, he has sent fire into my bones and it prevaileth against me. So the picture of fever, of, of such a deep burning from, from the very core of our being, you have this picture of fever taking us. So um, some people who have, um, who go through trauma or go through pain will have physical reactions as well as mental, right? And they, they can actually come down with fever because of the extent of their suffering. Um, he uses the picture, uh, or she, the, the, the woman of Jerusalem, says, He has spread a net for my feet. He hath turned me back. So the picture is all these traps, all these booby traps set around and every time she tried to move forward and she tried to take a step forward, she had to take two steps backward because there were, uh, and the more she wiggled and the more she tried to get away, the more in, uh, enmeshed she became in the net because he was drawing her. He was pulling her. You have, um, he hath made me desolate and faint all the day. So at the same time that she is being dragged toward him, she still feels the coldness and the, the distance and the, and the um, division between her, herself, and, and God. Desolate and faint. Um, and now... The yoke of my transgression is bound by his hand. Now she begins to admit. She makes for the first time an acquiescence, not just that God is doing it, but that he is doing it because of her own transgression. Right? And she talks about the yoke. Now we know that Christ's yoke is light and easy. But... You know, from the Isaiah, he says that um, our sins have been bound to us like a cart rope. So there's a sense in which um, the weight of our sin is harnessed onto our backs to such a way it, it continually drags us down. It's the kind of weight that we can't um, walk out from under, that we can't pull off, that... Instead, it weighs us down to hell. <clears throat> they are entwined and come up upon my neck. It says it's, it's like the more I struggle against this yoke, it, the, the iniquity itself is like um, the, the wooden yoke. It's like it has grown, it has um, sprouted and grown um, limbs and has begun to entwine itself around me to such a way that there is no extricating myself from this yoke. He hath made um, my strength to fall. The Lord hath delivered me into their hands from whom I am not able to rise up. So the picture is an illusion of Samson, right? He cut his hair. He thought he would go out and shake himself as at other times, but he, felt, he found that his strength was gone from him. He was bound to the yoke of the millstone. 
um, he was entwined and he had to pull the millstone. He had to, um, he, he, he lost his strength. He lost his sight and he, um, served in the millstone of his own sin. Then she says that the Lord has targeted her, has targeted her. Right? Has targeted certain groups within her. Verse 15. The Lord has trodden underfoot all my mighty men in the midst of me. If you think of the heroes, you think of the, the, the men who um, take care of business in the city of Jerusalem. The, the, um, the public servants and the um, leaders of business. And the spiritual leaders and the the um the ones who have the ability to take care of the things that a, a city needs taken care of, they've been stomped down. He has called an assembly, he's literally he's called a party against me to crush my young men. So, he says that God made a party, but it was a, it was a trap. Lured the young men into this party in order to carry them away. And we understand uh, from this, perspe- from this, uh, from this illusion that guys like, um, Daniel and the three Hebrew children were included in this group, right? They were these young men. They were the ones that were carried off um, while they were still quite young to be trained up and educated in the, in the way of Babylon. And then it says... The Lord hath trodden the virgin, the daughter of Judah, as in a wine press. So, a graphic, yet it's a poetic way of, of looking at the, um, the violence. Right? So taking, um, I don't know if anyone has ever seen um, wine being made, especially like... Um, how they make it over in Italy or places like that where you dump all the grapes in this huge vat and then you jump up and down until all the grapes are squished and the juice runs out at the bottom. That's the picture. Um, That anything that was good, anything that was pure, anything that was, um, you know, the grapes, how they kind of, in a sense, congeal the the rain and the dew and the sunshine and put it together in this in this fresh fruit and then that life is just um squeezed out that's the picture there and again talking about Jerusalem or the daughter of Judah as a virgin so the ones who are suffering, the ones who are facing the consequences the most are the young ones, right? The ones who haven't even, some of them haven't even gotten to an age of accountability or an age of responsibility at least. Um, And perhaps they weren't the ones who had committed the sin, but yet they are the ones who are paying for the sin in this sense. And it kind of, if we think of the kind of the broad picture of the history of Israel, you had the exodus, right? And you have the exile, the two bookends to the kingdom of Israel. In the exodus, they came out of Egypt, but they still had Egypt in them. And so for 40 years, God had them wander in the desert until the old folks died and the young folks came in and inherited the promise 
right? Um, and this is kind of the same picture that, and Jeremiah, you know, tells us, we alluded to this last week, but Jeremiah tells us in Jeremiah 22 and 23 that actually the ones that get carried away into Babylon were the good fruit, the good seed. And they would be preserved. And through the process of the exile, they would be purified and actually accomplish the purpose that God has given them in, um, in, in saving them. And then verse 16, to kind of bring it all down, for these things, he says, for these things I weep. So after enumerating and kind of taking stock of the difficulties, of the pains, of the suffering, kind of walking through that process and laying out to their thought process the things that, um, that um, are traumatizing them. Then... They just let these things wash over them, right? For these things I weep. Mine eye, mine eye runneth down with water, because the comforter that should relieve my soul is far from me. Suddenly, after going through the pain and looking around, there's like, there's no one to comfort my children are desolate because the enemy prevaileth. So that, um, even in this, uh, this second half of the chapter, this also is se separated into two parts. Verses 12 to 16 is the city of Jerusalem enumerating her suffering and coming to this moment of overwhelming grief and um, just giving herself over to weeping and crying out. And then we come to transition here in verse 17, and then in verse 18, we see a kind of a, a, a beginning to change. Verse 17, in this transition, the result of this outpouring of weeping has left the speaker at first numb and distant, and now looking at her pain almost in the third person. We, we hear a change. Um, so she starts talking about herself almost in the third person. Instead of saying, um, my pain, my sin, my sorrow, she says, Zion spreads forth her hands, and there's none to comfort her. The Lord has, concern, has commanded concerning Jacob that his adversaries should be round about him. Jerusalem is as a menstruous woman among them. So here I am, and this is what it's like. At this point, the mourner begins to take some stock in her condition, gain some perspective. Here I am, here are my adversaries, there is the Lord, and this is my condition. So objectively, kind of trying to take stock. And then, that brings us to the second half of this portion, verses 18 to 22. This leads us to turning the eyes wholly from self to behold him. And, and man, the downstroke on verse 18 is just so powerful. If it, it, um, Reading it in, in, in Hebrew, you come to the, the letter Tzadi. Now, the letter itself, Tzadi, that's the name of the letter that this verse 18 starts with. But the word Tzadi also... Um, the letter is almost identical with the word righteous, righteousness. Um, growing up in Albania, I had a friend um, who, um, an, Eric, an Arabic name is, is very, very, Arabic and, and Hebrew are very similar. And his name was Tzadik. Um, and I learned early that that means righteous righteous and and it was it's it's so cool to hear righteous art thou o lord right the lord is righteous after she has gone through these steps of grieving right and she's enumerated her pain and she's 
poured out herself in, in weeping and crying and begins to come to herself again, she looks around and she says, The Lord is righteous. Why? For I have rebelled. Right? We turn our mind toward faith. I have rebelled against his commandment. At this point, repentance is coming. There, um, the, the, the sorrowing has brought them to this moment of cleansing, this, this cleansing process. The, the mourning, um, not to dim, dis, diminish at all or dismiss at all the process of looking at the sorrow and looking at the pain and looking at the vulnerability and looking at um, all these reasons for grieving but now being able to, through that process, come face to face with the Lord brought me here and the Lord is righteous. He hasn't lost his grip. He hasn't lost his perspective. He hasn't lost his control. He hasn't lost his position as Lord of the universe. Not only that, he hasn't lost his attribute of being right, of being just, of being good. The Lord is righteous. I have rebelled against his commandment. His commandments were there as protection. His commandments were like buffers. They were like fences. They were like um, guardrails to keep me on the straight and narrow, and I deviated from it. And the Lord is righteous. I have brought this upon myself. Here, I pray you all people, and behold my sorrow. Here again, remember in verse 12, she cried out, Is it nothing to you all you that pass by to see, is there any sorrow like my sorrow? In verse 12, but now in verse 18, um, again she says, Here I pray you all people, again calling for attention, but in this time, the motivation is completely different. She says, look at my sorrow and learn a lesson from it. Don't just, she's not calling out, not that she isn't to be pitied, she is. And again, not diminishing her pitiable condition, but gain some wisdom from this. Learn your lesson from this. Don't let yourself be fooled by this condition um, and, and, and go through this process. Uh, so she begins to enumerate her sins. I had called for my lovers, but they deceived me. My priests and my elders, they gave up the ghost in the city because they were all pursuing their own things. They sought the, me to relieve their own souls. And behold, O Lord, for I am in distress. My bowels are troubled. My heart is turned within me. I have grievously rebelled. Abroad the sword bereaveth. At home there is a fire. I apologize. I, I realize that the hour is late. But verse 21, it brings them to this place. There is none to comfort. The enemy's reaction was celebration. The Lord's reaction, they are bringing that day. And in this day, in this day of judgment acknowledging that God is righteous. So this whole second half is bringing to a process by enumerating their sin and recognizing the judgment of God, recognizing that God has appointed a day of judgment, that at that day all will stand on a level footing before God and that the Lord is righteous. He completes this perspective. Verse 22, Let all their wickedness come before thee, and do unto them as thou hast done unto me for all my transgressions. For my sighs are many, and my heart is faint. So, in this chapter, and in this, the end of this chapter, we see that based on the emotional and the compassionate preaching of the, pre of the prophet in the first half, 
and pointing out with a loving finger to the city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem has come to them herself, recognized her pain, and acknowledged the purpose of it. And most of all, has turned her attention to the Lord. And so in our next chapter, chapter 2, we'll see how it is of the Lord all that has happened. Y'all have a good evening, and the Lord bless you.